Yo, yo, what's going on? Shalom, shalom, what's going on, everybody? Thank everybody for tuning in. Thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, this is definitely going to be an uh, awesome lesson today. Uh, shalom to you as well. Uh, shalom to the family out there. Uh, thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, this definitely is a hot topic, hot top topic of conversation that we're going to be having. Um, definitely look forward to seeing all my brothers and sisters this uh, Saturday uh, Shabbat service. Uh, definitely going to be awesome. Uh, we have a awesome, awesome Shalom, Sister Zelda. Uh, we have an awesome service uh, this coming, this Saturday um, at 1 p.m. Uh, in Jacksonville, Florida uh, at Believers of One Messiah uh, Church. Uh, I am the Moray, or the teacher or the pastor of Boom, um, and I'm definitely excited about it. But we got a hot topic of conversation today. Um, as many of you may have seen the title, uh, the title of this particular lesson is entitled The Law and the Menstrual Cycle. Uh, this is something that um, um, a particular conversation that um, is definitely needed to be had. Um, I, I did a Q&A a long time ago, maybe like two years ago, I think. Uh, I can't remember the exact date. But I did a Q&A um, a question on uh, just different topics, fringes, um, and one of the one of the, the conversations or the questions um, that I got was what's going on, Shalom to everybody, Shalom was about um, the menstrual cycle and uh, being in the same house and those types of things. Um, so I did this Q and A like. I guess it was a year and a half ago. Um, shalom to you, Brother Reggie. Uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago when I did this Q&A session. Um, but this is something that always kind of comes up um, when we start talking about um, the Torah and things of that nature. Um, this is one of the main things that um, married couples, those who uh, want to decide to... Um, live by Torah um, to the best of their ability or whatnot. Um, this is like one of the main ones. All right. Hey, Apostle, what's going on, man? We had awesome service last night, man. Uh, bless you for that powerful word, man. It was awesome. Um, definitely uh, out in Indianapolis. That city definitely needs it. I was out there last year um, and they definitely need it out there. They need some encouragement, um, a lot of violence and murders and stuff like that. So definitely, uh, Indianapolis, definitely a great, um, they, they are blessed to have, uh, an apostles after God on heart, man, a man who love the people out there. So definitely you be, you be logged on live tonight. I'll definitely be tuning in to check it out. Um, but bless you while you're out there, Apostle Keith K. Curry. Um, so this is, this conversation comes up, uh, often amongst couples, but oftentimes it does, it's a, particular uh topic that comes up um, of, of with many of them who use the particular topic um to try to talk about well you know or to discredit um because you're striving or to to try to live right and live holy uh and righteous according to uh the scriptures according to Torah and um so, you know, the thing is, is that um, I think there needs to be some clarity. Uh, there needs to be conversation. I think the Lord uses a lot of these things and, and specific, specific subjects to get us to go back uh, and relook at things or re-examine things um, from the scriptures and how he wants us to live. Uh, if you know any married couples or anybody um, that may have this question, please invite them to this live uh, Y'all know oftentimes I don't tell you guys to invite people uh, to the live, but um, people who may have questions when it comes to the Torah, when it comes to certain things, especially when it comes down to now dealing with uh, the menstrual cycle. Can you stay in the same household? Can you touch your wife? Can you touch your husband? All of these different things, because many oftentimes uh, people ask this question because they like, OK, my my I'm on my cycle, but I want to get my my husband uh, a kiss before I go to work. I want to give um, my wife a hug before she leaves and go to work and all of these different things. And so what happens is, listen, Torah is not supposed to be bird a burden, okay? 
This is what this is what got the this is what got Israel in trouble. This is what got the when they start beginning to follow the Pharisees after the Babylonian captivity and they start adding their traditions to um in their own ways and and created customs to God's word to to Yah's uh, instruction in the way in the way that we should live. That's what got Israel in trouble because they begin to make it ritual ritualistically or religiously um, and following man. And what ended up happening is um, the, the, the law became burdensome to them or they weren't trying to keep it. They were willfully um, not following the instructions. And so that's the issue. It's not supposed to be a burden. It's a guideline. OK, if you fall, because now we're under grace, there is grace that covers us. But when you don't willfully transgress and you and things happen and you you fall and and whatnot, because you're going to fall. It's just what it is. OK. All right. And it's not supposed to be burdensome, but OK, you don't supposed to reside and lay in the place that you fail or tr or transgress, not willfully. Then you find yourself, you get back up and you say, okay, now let me get back on track. Okay, grace covered me. I didn't willfully do it, but grace covered me. And now, therefore, let me get back on track because Torah is a guideline in how we should live, those of us who are true worshipers. We're supposed to live according to the instruction and the guideline which the Father gave. Okay, now I'm not telling you to sacrifice animals because you, not, you can't do that. If that's the case, then Christ died in vain. That's not what I'm talking about. But there are other instructions and guidelines that are put in place that are not the rituals of the Torah that is in place that we should be following and that we should live by in order to make sure that we're living righteous lives and, and following the instructions of the Most High and not from a perspective of it's a burden or we find excuses to make while, while uh, saying that I'm not going to do it because, oh, I can't do it. it, it listen, it's, it, it, there's some things that you cannot make an excuse for saying that you can't do. You, you, you can't make an excuse saying I can't not murder somebody. Like, come on, like you can, you can control yourself. All right. And not murdering somebody. You can control not hating somebody. You can control not stealing from somebody. You can control uh, not backbiting or bearing false witnesses up against someone. You can control those things. So it's not a burden. Okay. It's a, God, and it's a part of a heritage. It's a part of a custom. It's the way that we should live. It's instructions and the things that we should follow as lovers of the Most High. We love him. We love what he does for us. So therefore, we want to be obedient. So this topic comes up. Well, well, what did you do? Oh, oh, you think you're righteous. You think you're more holier than thou. See, what happens is the way you live People, we talk about dogma or being dogmatic, and I'm against being dogmatic about certain things, but I'm not all for just being all loose schools, right? There's a balance, okay? But there are people become dogmatic in their approach to you because you want to live a certain kind of way according to the instructions. They, they start making indictments against you, and all you said was, this is the way I live. All right, you're not saying to them, hey, you know what? You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. No, you say, well, this is how I live. This is what I do. This is what my house does. This is the way we live. And what people start doing is they start trying to pick certain things out of the law and ask you a question on, not because they want clarity and an answer, but because they're trying to trip you up. That is a qualification of a Pharisee. So what happens is people start calling you a Pharisee, but then really they're practicing or qualify more as a Pharisee than you do because they're trying to spot pick certain things out of Torah to tell you, oh, so what do you do with this? Oh, so how do you do this? Oh, I know you know. Do you have a, do you have a separate house? They start bringing all this other stuff up which they have no complete understanding about and which we're going to go into right now. And we're going to look at dealing with the law and the menstrual because this always comes up. This is one of the top five things that comes up 
And when people, when you, when people start asking questions and you start having dialogue about something, about dealing with uh, Torah and how you live and things of that nature, this is one of the main things come up. This is like the top five thing that comes up dealing with the menstrual. Okay. And do you have a separate house? Cause you know, you're supposed to be living in another house. That's not what that actually means. All right. And we're going to go into the Torah and we're going to look and see exactly what it means so that way we can get some clarity and hopefully brothers and sisters can get some clear understanding of what this instruction is about. Okay. First of all, let's start. We're going to start at, at Bereshit or Genesis chapter number one, Genesis chapter number one, Genesis chapter number one. We first must understand something and we must understand the beginning. OK, we must understand that the law, OK, before there was a Moses was in effect, was in effect. OK, before there was a Moses. OK, and let's look at this. All right. And reason being, when I'm when I'm talking about the law, we're talking oral here. We're not talking about that it was written on stone. OK, all right? and the writing of the stone of the law of the Torah came later on with it being written on stone. But it was an effect in the earth. Because it was verbalized, it was spoken, and the people knew the difference between what was wicked. Noah knew the difference between what was clean and unclean. Uh, uh, um, Lot knew the difference between if a man lie with another man the way he lie with a woman, that it was wicked. Lot knew that, that sodomy was wicked. Okay? So this was way before Noah was even, I mean, Moses was even born, was most even came into the earth. Okay. Cain got punished because he murdered his brother Abel way before Moses was even or even thought of or born. Okay. In the earth realm, as I'm saying. Okay. So we have to get an understanding of this and really what's going on. All right. But let's look at Genesis. Let's go to the beginning. Genesis chapter number one, and we're going to look at verse number 26. Okay. And Elohim said, which, and God said, if you read in the KJV translation, all right. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. If you notice that the father, that Elohim is plural, okay, not singular. I know in the English version, in the English translation, it uses the term God in a singular context or singular term or translation. But really, when you look at it in the Hebrew or you understand Elohim, it is plural. OK, so he says, let us. That's why the let us is there. All right. But notice he didn't say man has dominion over each other. He says that man has dominion over the beast and the things that are within the earth. All right. Because the father uh, they or Elohim created them mankind, male and female, to have dominion over the things of the earth. Okay? So, verse number 27. And so Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim created he, him. Male and female created he, them. So if, he, if, so if Elohim created male and female, that is also letting us know that the likeness, okay, which was given, the image, meaning that, okay, the same way he told Jeremiah, I knew you before you was formed in your mother's womb, okay, which we have to clearly understand that if he created us, male and female, he knows us inside, outside, spiritually, carnally, he understands how our bodies work. He understands. He designed us. He's the master architect in the creating process of mankind. He created the digestive system. He created the heart, the lungs, the way we breathe. That's why we don't have gills. We have lungs. He created the eyes and how the eyes would function, the nose in which it would breathe, the teeth and, and the saliva in the mouth that would help the mouth out. All of these different things. Okay. He created all of these various things, all the way from the hair on our head, all the way to the pinky toe. And everything that was, that it was given to us is given to us for a specific reason. Also, it is given to us 
to be able to, as a body, to work together. So the body in the way it's designed, it all works together, which means it goes to our point. We're dealing with the menstrual cycle. So we need to understand why a woman has a menstrual, okay, which we're going to get to that here in a minute. And the reason why, all right, but let's look at here, verse number 28, and Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, created them, structurally designed them, gave them reproductive reproductive organs, okay, to be able to procreate, all right, let's look at this, all right, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So every single person and every single body, all right, was born and created into this earth, okay? So now you have all these people on the face of the earth. You got all these people on the face of the earth. So now let's fast forward. All right. Now let's go to, um, let's look at 1 John 5. 1 John 5 and verse number 2. By this we know that we love the children of Yah, children of Elohim. When we love Elohim and keep his commandment or we love Yah or Yahweh, okay, the Father, and we keep his commandments. So we know that there was a replenishing. There was a whole lot of people on the face of the earth. And there were, the commandments were already established before they was written on stone and given to a one group of people. Everybody had, now that's why the earth was destroyed by water, okay? Because everybody had an opportunity to be obedient to these commandments, but they did not. So when we look at here in 1 John 5 and 2, by this we know that we love the children of Yah. When we love Yah and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yah that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. They aren't burdensome. Why? Because these commandments are commandments for a specific reason of protection also. And also from a, from, from it's, it's given to distinguish the difference between who is, who are the children of the most high. Okay. Now look at this right here. It's no different from your commandments at your parents' house. When your parents give you commandment, you better be in this house before the street lights come on. Hey, don't, hey, if the light, if, if it's dark outside, you need to call me to let me know. All of these commandments that are given to, to you as a child to protect you and to keep you, to make sure that you don't get snatched by a stranger and all these other things, to make sure that things go right in their house, to make sure things go right with the relationship between you and the parent to show your obedience and your love to your parents by being obedient to what they say. Okay. All of this. That's why I said, we know that this says by this, we know we love the children of Yah. Okay. Verse number four of first John five for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Why? Is because the world has a different set of laws. They have a different set of rules. And if you abide by the world's rules and its laws, more than likely you're going to not, or if you abide by theirs, more than likely you're going to come in a violation of the Most High. Because the way we look at the world now, their set of rules and their guidelines is totally opposite of what the Father said. Okay? Totally opposite. So we overcome because we keep the most high's instructions. We keep his instructions. We keep his commandments. So therefore our protection when the world comes against us is the one who created the world and the one who created man. He knows man better than man know themselves. So your protection lies in being obedient. 
okay? And being obedient to what the Father says to make sure that your protection comes in time when the world is coming against you and when Hasatan is coming against you. So therefore, those, these instructions keep you and protect you also from the wrath of the Father, all right? But also of the wickedness of the world. So it says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Even our faith. Now jump down, let's go back here. Let's go back to, to, uh, to the old covenant. Well, let's go back to Torah. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter number seven. Now that we see there's plenty, there's plenty of people in the world. We know that the law was there orally in the word that was given to mankind. But now let's look and see because mankind, the world was destroyed by, by water. Now let's look and see if mankind, let's see something different after the flood. After the flood, the law or the instruction goes from mankind to now a specific people given it to show everyone else how to do it. Why? Because orally the father spoke and gave it to the world. But for some reason, the world, uh, we didn't like it that way. We need to be visual. We need to see somebody else following and keeping it. It's the same way that when Christ came, showed us how to do it, giving us a visual demonstration. So Israel was given the Torah on stone as an instruction to not only live by it, but set an example to the world because the world needs to see something. Man needs to see something. We're visual people. Man need to see something in order to keep it. Oh, I don't believe it. Hey, I don't believe it unless I see it. That's our, you know, that's our slogan. Our slogan is, I don't believe it unless I see it. So the father said, okay, cool. You're not going to have an excuse. I'm, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to choose a people. I'm going to give them the instructions. I'm going to give them a leader to give them the instructions. And therefore, maybe we'll see if they will get rid of the excuse that you don't see nobody actually living this way, living the right way. So guess what? Now in Deuteronomy, now we're going to get and we're going to see where the father chooses Israel. Okay, let's read this here. Deuteronomy chapter number seven. Deuteronomy seven and verse number six. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Out of all the people on the face of the earth, the most I say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Because y'all ain't going to have no excuse. I'm going to get rid of all these excuses y'all love to have. I'm going to send somebody and send some people. Hopefully they will be obedient. And in their obedience, that they will give a demonstration to the world. Look at what it says. Verse number six again. He says, the Lord thy God have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Verse number seven, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number. See, we love to choose people because they got to follow. Oh, you know what? Hey, man, hey, come be a part of what I'm doing. Man, you got a whole lot of following. I want to be a part of what you're doing because it seemed like a whole lot of people following you. See, that's how we choose that. See, our ways are not the father's ways. The father said, I didn't choose you, Israel, because you were more in number. I didn't do that. See, when the father choose you, he don't, it doesn't, it's not even about how many people following you. See, for us, we choose leaders based off how many people following them. We choose things based on, we can't do ministry properly if we don't have a crowd. The crowd causes us to do ministry supposedly effective. How many people will do ministry if it's only five people? I see people close down churches, close down uh, 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 camps, close down this because, oh, 
It's been five years and we only got five people. And so they close it down. Then they go change the name and think that's going to draw some people. You right back at square one because you weren't even faithful over the few that the father gave you. Now you're thinking that you're going to shut that down and go revamp yourself. Okay. Revamp yourself trying to get more people because that gives a, it's a gimmick. This is not a gimmick. The father doesn't do this. He doesn't choose that way. Look at David. I mean, we can go throughout the scriptures. All right. He doesn't do that. He doesn't function that way. Okay. Let's look at this right here. It says, look, in verse number um, six, Deuteronomy 7 and 6, we get into the menstrual cycle. I'm just going down this to show y'all how these things go in order. All right. And why Israel was given this, these instructions. It says, above all people that are upon the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. Out of all the people on the face of the earth, Israel was the fewest that he chose. He chose them. They didn't choose him. Israel didn't choose him. No, he chose Israel out of the fewest on the face of the earth at the time. Look what it says here. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep his oath, which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Did not the father do this, even though you were the fewer on the planet? Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant, which keepeth covenant, meaning that I don't care what people say, what testament it is, the father keepeth the covenant we make the covenant with. That's what he does. He doesn't go back on his word. Okay, let's keep reading here. Look what it says. And keep his covenant to a thousand generations and repay of them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments, Israel and anybody else that have attached themselves to Israel and accepted the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do. Action, word, works, do. Action, word, works, do. Now jump down, let's go over to Deuteronomy 32, all right? And then we'll go into the minstrel, okay? Deuteronomy 32 and 8. When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, we just read in Genesis, all right? We just read in Genesis about the earth being full with all types of people, all right? When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam. So the father is separating the sons of Adam. All these kids are born of Adam. Now he's separating because now he's going to choose a people. The fewest out of all those that was born of Adam. Okay. Look what it says right here. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. He chose Israel. For the Lord's portion, after he divided and separated everybody, his portion, okay, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Meaning Israel is the lot of his inheritance out of all the people on the face of the earth. Now, now that we know that he created man, male and female, he knows our makeup. He gave the woman a menstrual cycle for a reason. And we're going to read here and find out. He made the, he created the man and gave him seed. Okay. For a specific reason. For them to replenish the earth. Okay. So now we're going to look at the law and we're going to see why he gave the law and the understanding of the minstrel and to understand 
why he said to separate. Does that mean you can't touch your wife? Does that mean you can't touch your spouse? Okay. Now we're talking about here, they talk about a physical temple. Of course, now our bodies have become the temple. Okay. No longer just a physical building or a place. All right. Or a physical building, but now our bodies become the tabernacle. Now, but let's keep looking here. Let's look at this. Leviticus chapter number 15. And many people love to try to trip you up with this. Oh, well, you know you're transgressing the Torah. You're transgressing the law. So you know you're not keeping the law because you stay in the same house with your wife. And according to the law, now these are people who don't even study the law. People who don't even try to attempt to keep the law. But they're trying to tell you about following the instructions of what you can't do and what you're not doing when they themselves don't even attempt to do it. The father rejoices even when you attempt to. You may not even have it right all the way. And therefore, there's a there's a, a clause in the Torah that protects those who are ignorant. Okay? There is a clause that what protects you for being ignorant. Because many brothers and sisters don't know, all of us don't know everything. Okay, so there's some things that we just don't do because we ignorantly don't know. But I'm going to keep what I know. Okay, and therefore grace will cover me in my ignorance of things that I don't know. And that's according to the Torah. Okay, that is according to the Torah. All right, so therefore I'm going to keep what I know. All right, I'm not going to sit here and know something and don't even keep it just willfully as James talks about. Being respect to a person, that's a willful sin. Meaning if you willfully sin or willfully transgress the Torah, you might as well have done all of them because it's talking about willful sin. Okay, this is what we're talking about here. Now, let's look at this here and get an understanding of can you touch your spouse? Are you transgressing the Torah? Okay, and why did he say this and what did this mean when it came to the Torah and why to separate or do not touch your spouse? It's a reason why. Okay. Leviticus chapter number 15 and 19. Let's get some clarity here by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 19. Starting off in 19. And if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood. Here it is. She shall be put apart seven days. Um, Ladies, don't most of you, your cycle last between six and seven days on an average. So the father have created you knowing that your menstrual will last that long. So therefore this law is based off of your cycle. That's why most brothers, that's why even now, all right. And brothers shouldn't even be touching no kind of intercourse with the sister during that time, because that's a cleansing process. OK, it's a part of the body. He created it. He designed the body. He knows. Don't nobody, not even the father wants to even know of anybody having any type of intercourse. First of all, let's 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 go beyond the father. OK, we know that the father know that it's just unclean and not righteous. You yourself. OK, why would you even want to even touch? OK, or even go into while she's cleansing, going through a cleansing process. This is the reason why there were no women in the temple. This is why there were no women priests in the temple. Okay? Because this process of cleansing is considered unclean because she's going through a purification process of herself. Okay? Right, she's going through a purification process. Why would you even want to even partake into something of that nature? Okay, I mean, come on, let's, let's let's think about it here. All right, that is just wicked. All right, that is completely wicked. And I'm pretty sure there were other nations. All right, at the time, they probably was doing all this type of stuff ritualistically. They probably was drinking. I, I mean, I'm just telling y'all, man, it it was some wicked folks. Okay, during the time, reason why the world had to be destroyed, them folks were doing all kind of wickedness. All right, they were doing all kind of wicked. So the father said, "No, I'm choosing you." Here are the guidelines, and this is what you're not going to do, okay? This is what you're not going to do. All right, let's keep reading this here, all right? It says right here, she shall be put apart seven days, and 
whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until evening. See there, they stop right there. See that? There you go. See, I told you. See, you transgress. Did you, did you kiss your wife? When you do you kiss your wife while you're on while she's on her cycle? If so, you transgressing the law. See that you ain't keeping the law. That's how they see they bring indictments against you with that type of stuff. They're just stopping that one verse, verse 19, and they base a whole apologies. They base a whole apologies or apologetics or around that one particular thing by trying to bring an indictment against you, saying that you so you, you not you, that basically what they're trying to say is you think that you're more holier or righteous than me. And therefore, what happens is because you are keeping what you know. Therefore, they get a level of conviction. They don't want to say it because it requires them to step their game up. So therefore, they don't want nobody to do it because that justifies them not even attempting to. That's basically what this is all about when people start bringing up these type of claims. But we're going to keep reading and get an understanding of why he said don't do it. Okay, look at what it says in verse number 20. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean, okay? Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed, whosoever toucheth her bed, all right, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. Verse number 22. And whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes. Why is he saying that? There's a reason why. There's a reason why these men shouldn't be touching nothing because she's considered unclean. Okay? And everything that she touches is unclean. There's a reason why. There's a reason why we're going to see here. Verse number two, verse number 21. And whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat up, that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. Verse 23. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, she, I'm sorry, he, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until evening. Verse 24. And if any man lie with her. Now, see, now it's going from you touch it, anything that she touched. You touch the bed. You touch the a cup. You touch a fork. If you kiss her, anything that she, even if you sit in the same chair that she sit upon, it's considered unclean. So now the Lord goes even further because we so slick. Oh, well, he didn't say I couldn't sleep with her. See, that's the, see, that's the, that's how the games we play. But the father in his all knowing being, he knows us better than we know ourselves. That's why I read in Genesis chapter one about him creating us. And that's why I read in first John about us being obedient and keeping the commandments. That's why I read in Deuteronomy about him choosing us. All right. All right. Uh, Mona here, please download and send. To the, okay. All right. We have to really understand what's going on. Okay, let's look at this now so we can get a complete understanding of this thing. All right. The, we know the father knows us. And we always come up with these excuses. And we 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 always go take things beyond. Hey, oh, you know what? He didn't say I can sleep with him. So I'm just gonna sleep. He he's even though we say he say he say don't touch or touch nothing that she touches, but yet we'll still try to throw a monkey wrench in there. Well, I you didn't say I could sleep with her. So the father say, okay, I got something for y'all. Verse number 23. All right, verse number 24. Look what he says here. If He says, and if any man lie with her at all, not only touch her cup, not only touch her drink, you can't even touch her, period. It's a reason why he's saying this. We're going to get to it. We're almost there. Look what he says. If any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him. He shall be unclean seven days. So guess what? If you touch her cup, you're unclean until the evening. If you sit in the chair that she sits in, you're unclean until the evening. If you 
Do anything, touch her clothes, anything. You unclean until the evening. You got to wash with just straight water. Uh, just like being baptized with just straight water, coming up, being clean. So therefore, let's move on. Straight water, no soap, none of that, just straight water. You're unclean until evening. But if you sleep with her and you get that blood on you because that blood is unclean, tainted blood. It is not pure. Your behind is unclean for seven days, just like her. So the father said, okay, look, I'm going to amp it up even more because y'all so wicked. I'm going to make y'all unclean for seven days, not just for the evening, but for seven days. I'm going to give you something to think about. Okay, I'm going to give you something to think about here because your behind is so doggone slick and wicked. You're going to do something else and try to take it even further. So I got to add a, uh, I got to add a clause in here to keep you from having intercourse. Okay, because you get get into yourself and don't want to start doggone being obedient to what I'm telling you. But let's keep reading here. Look what it says. Verse number 25. All right. It says, and if a woman have an issue. Okay. Now let me stop right here. In verse, in verse number 19 through 24, verses 19 through 24, that is a regular menstrual cycle. Okay. That's a regular menstrual cycle. Verse number 25 is about to deal with an uh, abnormal, extreme menstrual. There are some women on the face of this earth that go beyond a seven day cycle in their cleansing. Or we know what the one with the issue of blood. Okay. There are some women that go beyond that. Okay. Are there really men that want to? Sister Mary, you would be surprised. There are people that actually have intercourse with a woman on their cycle. They do. They get in the shower and do it. All kind of stuff. Okay. All kind of stuff. And the father like, this is, the, this is just, I, this is unclean. I mean, we, you can imagine the things that man think of. Think about how wicked the world was for the father to destroy with water. That's a wicked world. Man do all kind of stuff. I, I, they do all kind of stuff, man. You would be surprised at the stuff that they do. Okay, when a woman is on her cycle, uh, they have sex with animals. Come on, I mean, just think about this. Men sleep with animals. I mean, it's nothing that man won't do because they're so wicked. So the father got to put stuff in place to make sure. But when we start talking about, oh, this done away with, that done away with. That's why we got to start looking and going back and rereading Torah, rereading these instructions and look at them with a clear lens, not from a religious lens, but from a cultural lens, from a societal lens, from a kingdom lens, from a creation lens to be able to get an understanding of why the father put these things in place for us not to do. But then we, we, we turn around and we start following precepts of men and they, they men start telling, well, you ain't got to do this. The law don't wait. This, the law. I mean, all this. These things are in place for a reason. The father look at this stuff is disgusting. And yet, when we say this is done away with, I mean, come on. We, so now we said that the father is condoning things that he said that he discussed, things that he considered abominations. Now we simply say it's okay. Like we have to really understand that we can't do that. We can't have that type of message saying that we work that we that we, uh, that we uh, are our leaders within the kingdom. Okay. Now let's look at this. Here. Let's keep reading that verse number 25, starting an abnormal cycle and an abnormal menstrual. Okay. Verse number 25. Let's look what it says. And if a woman have an issue of her blood, many days, many days, look at what it says. Now verse 19, look at what it says in verse 19. If a woman have an issue in her blood, she should be put away for seven to put apart seven days. But guess what? In verse 25, it says, if a woman have an issue with her blood many days, meaning past the seven days, out of the time of her separation. Okay? Out of the time of her separation. Or if it run beyond the time of her separation, meaning that this is goes beyond the seven days. She has an abnormal cycle. Look at what it says. 
all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean until that thing ends. Until it stops, she's going to be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issues, all, I mean, shall be unto her as the bed of separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. And whosoever touches those things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. But if she be, un if she be cleansed of her issue, then shall she number to herself seven days. And after that, she shall be clean. Verse 29. And on the eighth day, she shall take upon her, tur upon her two turtles or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest. Meaning this ritual is not in place anymore. Okay. This ritual is not in place anymore because Christ done away with all those rituals. All right. Now let's read it. Bring them unto the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse number 30. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. There are burnt offerings. There are drink offerings. There are meat offerings. We have to be very careful, especially when we're using Apostle Paul, when Paul started talking about letting a man judge you and start talking about these offerings. So therefore, we start taking and don't even know that Paul is talking about drink offerings. Don't want to let a man judge you in drink. He's talking about drink offerings. Don't let no man judge you are in Sabbaths. Let no man judge you in meats. These are meat offerings. They are different type of offerings in the Torah. You have to read it and understand what the Apostle Paul is talking about. All right. But yet we've taken that and said, oh, don't let nobody judge you and, and, and not doing this. And that's clearly not what Paul is talking about. All right. I've done that lesson a million times. And unfortunately, I got to do it a million and one times. The show brothers and sisters exactly what Paul is saying. All right. But let's look at this here. This is not a Paul lesson. But let's look at this. Verse number 29. It says, two turtles, two pigeons. And bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they cannot come. She nor her husband cannot come to the temple until they are clean. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So this isn't about you can't touch your spouse. This isn't about you can't kiss your wife. This isn't about you can't grab her cup. This is about if you do it, you better not come to the temple until seven days. If you touch your wife, you better not show up your behind to the temple until seven days. Because if you come to the temple, you're going to die. That's what this is about. This don't have nothing to do with what people making it to be about. About, oh, you do, see, I, see, you stand in the same house with your wife. Well, of course, we don't have no more temple. All right. We waiting on the, we waiting on the last temple to be built. Okay, there, of course there is no temple now. All right, we're not in the land of Israel. Okay, we're not in Jerusalem. So therefore, we're in a land of our captivity. So therefore, this the temple perspective of it, these rituals we don't have to do and we won't have to do anymore, period. Because Christ now is the high priest. He got away all, he done away with all of the rituals that the Levitical priest had to participate in. Now he shed his blood. We don't need to slaughter. There's no need to be a, a menstrual uh, sin offering. Okay. There's no need to be a menstrual sin, sin offering. You don't need to bring no turtles or no doves. Christ already done that. He done away, took that away, took that out of the equation. There is no more sacrificing or no more sacrificial law. We don't have to sacrifice anything for the remissions of sin anymore because that's what Christ did. This particular law and what people try to use to trip folks up and try to make them seem as though they're hypocrites has nothing to do with you just living in the same house. It's all about if you touch your wife, if you touch anything that she touched because the temple was, I mean, we talk about pure OK, there is nothing that can stand in the presence of the father that is unrighteous. And that's where he wanted to have his spirit dwell there. So therefore, the priest himself could not go off touching no woman. 
The priest could not take nothing out of an unclean woman's hand because guess what? If he walked his behind into the holies of holies, he was going to drop dead. Okay, he was going to drop dead. And guess what? Oftentimes there were many priests that dropped dead. You know why? Because they thought the father was playing with their behind. And they came up strolling up in that temple haphazardly the same way we scroll up today in the place of worship and just come, just come and play with the father. And we don't even be focused on the father. We focus on looking at the sister with the tight dress on. And, and the sister, she focused on coming up in the up in the temple with her tight dress on. And people are dressing up just to dress up just because they it's a fashion show and all this other stuff. If we were under the covenant in which your behind would get put to death, it'll be a whole, people, a whole lot of people dropping dead. And in fact... It's a whole lot of people, especially leaders, they're going to find themselves dropping dead because they want to have their man and have their wife too. They want to have a man and a woman too. They want to have a mistress and their wife too. And the father, going, it's a whole lot of people going to start going, going to start having to get dealt with because they, they are abusing grace, willfully sinning, okay? Willfully transgressing the Torah, okay? Now, let's look at this right here because we have to understand that oftentimes there were priests that tied bells around their waist, okay? And, they, and the other priest, if another priest thought your behind was unclean, they put a rope around your behind and they had you to walk up in there. So when, they, so when you drop dead, they could just pull your behind out with the rope because they ain't going in there to pull your behind up out of there, okay? That's what this is about. The father already said she gonna be unclean. So play with it if you want. Don't show up to the temple until her behind is clean until after them seven days, okay? Or until after evening because reason why he put, reason why the men got the portion of evening and not the whole seven days unless you have set intercourse with her. If you touch something that she done, men often were in the temple on the daily. The temple was open daily every day. The priests had different shifts. OK, so therefore there, had, there were men constantly going to the temple. So the father said, I'm not going to be as harsh on you if you grab her cup or if you kiss her. You just got to wait till the evening time until the next day. And then you could come in there the next day. But if you want to go as far as having sex with her while she's on her menstrual, I'm going to punish your behind for seven days. You ain't don't come to the temple in seven days because if you come down on the sixth day, I'm going to kill your behind. All right. And this is what it's about. This is about not showing up to the temple if you are unclean. This is why it says right here, okay, in verse number 28, all right? It says right here, let me see, let me find it. Verse number 29 is verse number 28. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days. And after that, she shall be clean. Verse number 29. And on the eighth day, she shall take unto her two turtles or two young pigeons and bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Because if she's not, if she's unclean, the priest ain't taking nothing from her behind. Because the first thing the priest want to do is check and act, make sure her husband, hey, have you examined her? Has her cycle broke? Is she unclean? So she's she been clean for seven days. This is the eighth day, right? Yes. Okay. So the husband is standing there giving uh, um, 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 the permission to let the priest know or because he's examined her as his, as his spouse, examined her. And so now when the okay is given, then the priest will take something from her because the priest would not dare allow her fingernail to touch his skin on any kind of way. Because if she's unclean and her fingernail touch his skin, now he unclean. And don't let, don't let it be he the only priest in there, okay? And the next priest don't show up until the eighth hour. And this, this the priest only been there 30 minutes. Ain't nobody protect, ain't nobody covering the temple. Now the temple ain't got nobody to watch over the temple. And that priest ain't going back in the temple. He not finna die for nobody. 
Okay, so this is what this was about. Let's keep reading here. All right, look what he says here, verse number 30. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. Verse number 31, here it is right here. Look at verse number 30 and watch what 31 says. Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel for their uncleanness that they die not. Why? Where are they going to die? Are they going to die at the house? No. Are they going to die out at the store? No. Where are they going to die at? It says it right here. That they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. You see that? So next time somebody try to tell you, oh, you know what? You ain't keeping the law because you still stay in the same house with your wife on her cycle. Brother, sister, did you read the context? Did you, did you go line by line in the scriptures? Did you really break this down and give an understanding and clarity? Did you just read one verse? Or are you um, giving talking points that you heard from somebody else? Because you can tell when people, when you become a student of the scriptures, and all of us should be students of the Torah, okay? We should be students of the Torah first. I tell people all the time, listen, I am a Messianic Hebrew. I believe in Christ as Messiah, I believe that he came and redeemed Israel back to the Father. I believe that all nations can have an opportunity to be in the kingdom. But I must first understand the instruction of the Father. I tell people all the time, you need to learn the instructions because you can't just learn the New Testament and don't even embrace or learn or have an understanding of what we could, what the Old Testament. OK, you need to understand the instructions of the Tanakh. You need to understand the words of the prophets. You need to understand the, the, the Torah that was given to Moses to give to the children of Israel, the instructions. You need to learn and understand these things and get an understanding that the father is not trying to give you these things to so you can't have fun. And the father not trying to give you these things because he don't like you. And the father not trying to give you these things because he, he just wants to see you fail and, and all this other stuff. And people trying to sit up here and say, oh, well, you, you can't do it. You can't keep it. They they misinterpret everything that Paul say. They misinterpret everything that Christ say. They misinterpret everything in the New Testament. He's not doing that. He told you it's not burdensome. He wants you to live a righteous, holy lifestyle. That way you can be a light to the world. That's why he wants you to follow and be obedient to how you live. Not because he wants you to make you so you can be conceited and think you better than somebody. All right. That's not what this is about. So the next time anybody tell you you transgress in the Torah because you stand in the house with your wife on her cycle, that is absolutely asinine. And we just read in the scripture. We went into the Torah. We just showed you why he told them, don't touch your wife. If you do touch her, don't come, come to the temple until the next day. And if you have intercourse with her while she's on her cycle, and the unclean blood gets on you, then you can't show up for seven days. Not, not, not a 24 hour period, but seven days now. Okay. And that's a reason why he put that in there because he don't want you showing up to the temple. You touch the priest, the priest go into the holies of holies. He dropped dead. You walk in the temple because you going in there to worship and you drop dead and all this other stuff. So the father put things in place for a reason. It's not because he don't want you to have fun. He, he, he called Israel, gave them the Torah to show the world. This is how you're supposed to live. But unfortunately, Israel started following their, following their leaders and the leaders start adding their own doctrine and their own ideas and traditions to the Torah. And therefore it got all jacked up and screwed up. Then when Christ came, he came to show us actually how to walk in Torah 
as well as receive grace. Grace didn't just show up in the New Testament. Grace was in the Old Testament too, okay? There was grace in the Old Testament and grace in the New Testament as well, okay? So we need to understand this, and I hope this lesson really bless you to break this down because I'm going to be doing a lot more lessons of all these claims that people just keep throwing out there and saying, oh, and, and trying to trip you up. Oh, do you do this? Well, you're not doing this. Oh, you better have, you better do this because if you ain't doing this, then you know you're going, you know you trip, you know you're not, uh, you know you break one, you break all. Like that whole un misunderstanding of what break one, break all means. Okay, I did a lesson on that a million times. I'm going to have to de do a million and one lessons. On that, I'm going to have to do a million and one lessons on Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge. I'm going to have to do a lesson on that. I'm going to have to do a lesson on all of this stuff. And it's a shame that we have to waste time, that way I look at it, going over all of these things. We got to go all the way back to the beginning, y'all. We need to relook really at this stuff because we're regurgitating things and talking points that's not scriptural, all because we want to justify how we want to live, okay? We want to justify how we want to live to make somebody else, all right? Uh, because make somebody else seem as though that they can't do something, all right? And you have to understand there is a clause in the Torah that protects you, which is grace, protects you in your ignorance. So if somebody asks me, do you keep all the law? I keep what I know. Okay. I keep what I know to keep. All right. There's a whole lot of other stuff that I may not be doing. But guess what? In the Torah, there's a clause that says that one who is ignorant is still covered. By grace. It's still covered by grace. See, that's a that's see, that's an area people don't even that's an area people don't even know. People are talking about, they try to throw out all this, you can't do, you know, all this other stuff. No, stop it. There is a clause in the Torah. You think the father don't know? There's a clause in the Torah. Keep what you know until you grow. Then when you learn something else, you keep that. That's that's what this, it's about baby steps, taking your time. This is not a burdensome thing. Take the baby steps, um, get an understanding, and as you continue to grow, grace covers your ignorance. Grace don't cover your willful sin. Grace covers your ignorance. That's what we got to understand. Grace covers your ignorance, not your willful sin. You can't just go out here just willfully sin, talking about you under grace. Like, come on, that don't make sense. Okay? That don't make sense, y'all. Okay, it makes no sense. That's not what grace is for. All right. But anyway, I hope this lesson bless you. I see a lot of you jumped on here towards the end of the lesson. Evangelist Tangy, what's going on? What's going on, sister? All right. They don't they, they don't want to grow. Just compete. Just compete. Absolutely, Evangelist Tangy. Absolutely. But shalom to you all, man. I, I, I pray that all of you get an understanding of the father's instructions. And um, this is what it is, man. And uh, I thank the Father for His Word. I thank the Father for sparking in us to re go to go back over and relook at a lot of the instructions that was given uh, for us. No, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Christ done away with that part of uh, the rituals or the sacrifice sacrifices uh, of things that were involved in the Torah. But the other things, the other aspects um, that are non that are non uh, sacrificial or ritualistic, we do observe those things, okay? All right, so I love all of y'all with the love of Christ, man. I pray that this lesson really bless you. The law and the menstrual cycle, all right? That was uh, something that was had to do with it. Shalom to, to, to you, Sister Tavara. How you doing, man? Blessings to you, Sister. All praises to the Most High. Uh, again, love all of y'all. May the grace of our Lord be with you. And um, I, I love what the Father is doing in the day and age right now. Uh, those is many people who are going back over a lot of our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, the father have uh, has is bringing a discussion and dialogue um, to the table um, so that all of us may be edified in in areas. I, I believe that we can learn uh, a lot from our Christian brothers, especially when it comes to worship. Um, I, I really believe that. I think a lot of us um, um, Hebrews, I think that um, when we came into the truth, uh, we abandoned a lot of things that the father never intended us to abandon. And from the beginning of the book until the end of the book, worship is a key component 
to our lives and we fail to do it. We come and we in the truth and we get stiff, we get stale. We don't even worship. And this has been a concern of mine. Information is not a problem within Israel. Worship is. Worship is a problem within Israel. Now, within our Christian brothers and sisters, they have the worship down pat. But they want to continue to justify lawlessness. They want to continue to justify. They want grace to cover their willful sin. They want to push grace and willful sin. And so that's if we all get an understanding, if the Israelite get back into the worship don't let people tell you that because you're worshiping and you're crying and and you and you, and your emotion that, that that that's just an emotion an unrealistic emotion no that's not an unrealistic emotion brothers cried in the scriptures brothers actually led worship now we've gotten cool on the Father. We're so cool and we're so educated. Now we don't even worship the Father. But the brothers in the scriptures worshipped the Father. They danced unto the Lord. They worshipped the Father. They lift up hands and worship. Which caused the sisters and the children to see it and begin to glorify the Father as well. Men, we not only have to take our rightful place back, but we have to get worship back. We got to get back to leading worship. But if we have the discussion, because that's the only part we lack in. We lack in the worship component and the spirit component. There's nothing wrong with those. With the knowledge and the education, the understanding of Torah, we know this stuff backwards and forwards. But the Father is requiring more from us. Our We should, we should go on another level. We should go on another level. We understand the Torah. We got that up. We got that down pat. We can teach in it. We can teach this book in and out. We got all the knowledge and everything. But imagine if we add the worship and the spirit component to the knowledge that we have, it will elevate us and catapult us. We shouldn't decrease in that because we're in the truth. Now we should elevate to another level. So the people will say, that's it right there. That's what I want. That's it. Don't just have them wanting the knowledge, but have them to say, man, they've got the knowledge and the worship and the spirit. Come on, man. When you have the spirit and when you have the worship, you don't have to worry about your child and worry about if your child is going to live. You will worship and you will praise your child to life. You will praise them. You will worship and praise the father. To the father got to move. He got to get up and move. I got to do something. My child is worshiping me despite of their situation. Despite of anything. I got to get up and, and move. I got to do something. I got I to gotta respond to that worship. I got to respond to that. I got to respond to that. But if we don't. And we continue to sit on the Father. Listen, a lot of our bondages has nothing so much to do with the curses. A lot of our bondage has a lot, has a, has a lot to do with us. It has a lot to do with us. The Father, like, you want, you want me to liberate your situation? Give me some worship. Give me some prayer. When, when has the last time us, I'm talking to Israelites right now. When was the last time us as Hebrews just came together with out even studying and came together and said, we're just going to worship. When the last time? When the last time? When was the last time? When was the last time? When was the last time? Because we, we're in the truth, right? We, we, the, the, we say that other people don't know nothing. When was the last time have we got together as a nation, Israel, and come together and say, you know what? We're going to have a convocation and we're just going to worship. When? I'm not talking about just one and two people. I understand. I'm talking about that. We all get together and have conferences to get knowledge. But when will we come together and say, 
We're going to come together. 50 of us. We ain't breaking no books. We ain't breaking no books. No books, no nothing. And we just going to worship. No music, no nothing. We don't need no music. We don't need no instruments. We don't need nothing. We just going to worship the creator. I'm going to call some of y'all bluff. Y'all say y'all in the truth. I'm going to call some of y'all bluff. I'm going to call a night of worship. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to see just how many people show up. We say we're in the truth. We say the father is with us and the father ain't with nobody else. We, I'm going to see just how much. We're all going to see just how much we say we down with the father. I'm going to call a night of worship. In any particular city. We can, we can have a conference in, all the, in any city we want. And we have brothers and sisters travel from everywhere. I'm going to see if y'all going to come to a specific city. Just to worship. Just to worship. Just to worship. We got to take our game to another level now. We got to, the father's requiring more from us now. He blessed us with the knowledge. Now he want to worship. Now he want to worship. See, it, it, it's about to be a lot of separating and dividing. In these last days, there's a lot of separating and a lot of dividing. There's a separating and a dividing within the Christian community. There's a separating and a divide. There's a lot of Christians want to keep Torah now and keep the Sabbath. There's a lot of brothers and sisters in Israel want to worship now. They got all the information. They can, they can search and research. Now they want something. Now they still missing something. They still feel as though they're missing something. And the Father have already been dealing with me about it. It's the worship that's missing. It's the worship, son. It's the worship, daughter. Now I require more from you. I woke you up. Now give me what's belonged to me. Give me the glory and give me the worship. If you can't worship here, how are you going to worship in New Jerusalem? When worship will be around the clock. I love all y'all with the love of Christ, man. I pray that you cannot eat without eating from the word of Yah. For man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Yah. I pray that you cannot drink without drinking from the living waters that flow from Christ. Let the light that is within you shine bright outside of you. And remember to love one another so that the world may know that we serve the true and living Yah. May your day be blessed. May your day be prosperous. May the Father give you the grace that, some, that, that, that someone would do something amazing and spectacular for you today. Even if it's buying your lunch. I've been telling people all the time lately, if you find a nickel on the ground, pick the nickel up and bless the Father for that nickel. If you follow a dime, if you find a penny, show the appreciation over the little things that you found and watch the father multiply those things in the day to come. Father want to do some great things. If you're in the Jacksonville area, we have service this coming Shabbat, this coming Saturday at 1 p.m. We have some awesome, awesome brothers um, some awesome brothers, man, that's going to be speaking as a part of our congregation. I am, I am excited and happy to be the pastor and the lead, the, the moray of, uh, boom, I believe it was a one Messiah, a church in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, if you need more information or if you have family and friends, people looking to worship, uh, we are a Messianic Hebrew congregation. Uh, we believe in all nations. Um, so we are not just a, black uh, congregation. When I, that is not our approach. That's not our goal. We preach them out and let the Father sort them out. I don't have time to try to figure out what your DNA is and looking at you and trying to figure out if you this or that. I'm going to let the Father handle his job. That's above my pay grade. 
My call is to teach. That's it. I'm going to let him figure out all the rest. He's already know who is who. So therefore, I'm not stepping in his lane. I'm not even qualified enough to do that. So I love all of y'all with the love of Christ. Man, y'all stay blessed and look forward to seeing you there next weekend. Also, we'll be traveling. I'll be in Akron, Ohio teaching uh, on the truth tour. Um, the, the topic of the, uh, the conference um, seminar is sound doctrine. So we're going to be doing that. Uh, I got Pastor Kelly with me as well as uh, Brother Kevin Waters, Elder Kevin Waters out of the Baltimore, uh, D.C. area. So he'll be traveling with me as well. So I love all y'all with the love of Christ, man. This has been a phenomenal lesson. And I thank the Father for blessing all of us, the law and the minstrel. If you're just not tuning in, you want to go back and watch this. Get an understanding about the minstrel cycle and why that law was in place and why he told us to separate and don't go to the temple and all that good stuff. All right. See you then. Shalom. Thank you.